All right, what's going on, Latin Wealth family? Welcome to another episode to the Latin Wealth Podcast. And we got another guest on the podcast, another young entrepreneur who's doing some incredible things in our community. He is the founder and CEO of a company called Thimble. Thimble is a in-school curriculum focused on STEM learning with hands-on learning, um, plus live and on-demand instructions and educational program. Uh, for people that don't know, what STEM stands for is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and they also provide coding and robotics education. Now, don't let all that go over your head. The reason why this is all so important is because these programs are, they don't exist in our communities. They don't exist in the public school. In fact, there was a, an interview that our guest had on that I guess that was on, he said that less than 45% of public schools have science and robotic programs in the school, which is it's crazy. Less than half the school in the United States have these programs, which is very important because um, a lot of these STEM programs and these STEM jobs and these opportunities, these careers, these are huge opportunities for kids in our community to change the dynamic of their their family right when it comes to these these stem jobs they're really in high demand they're high paying um and there's only going to be more of them so my point is we'll, we'll let our guests explain more about you know the importance of all of this but it's a very important program and um i just thought it would be amazing to have him on to share his story but enough of my talking enough me let me get out the let me get out the way. Uh, welcome, Oscar Pedroso, on the podcast. How are you doing today, bro? Doing well. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. It's it's awesome to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And I know my my introduction isn't going to do justice to what you guys, the impact that you guys are really having on the community and what you guys are really doing. We're definitely going to get into all of that. But I would love to know, man, so I was doing my research, you know, I've seen that you're active on Twitter. I'm, you're active on Twitter. You're active on LinkedIn. I don't think I've seen you very active on Instagram. Now, let me know, man, like, how do you stay focused uh, with, with all these social medias? I, I know that you, maybe you're not on Instagram that very much, but how do you stay focused on your business, man? Let some people know some tips out there that helps you stay on track. Yeah, you know, it's not something I'm really good at. Uh, okay. you know, I feel like there's so many social media channels out yeah. there. And I, I feel like I've chosen my top two favorites, which are Twitter okay. and LinkedIn. I just feel like that's where um, our message is amplified the most. So understanding like what channels you even want to say anything yeah. is important first. And uh, and then it, it's, it's tough in the beginning because you almost have to make it a habit. Mm-hmm. Because posting twice or however many times you want per week it takes work and you have to have uh, some kind of regimen in place, right? So mm -hmm. you don't uh, miss any deadlines. But once once you're able to build a, a, a small team around yourself, it's a, it gets a little easier. Mm -hmm. uh, like I can admit social social media marketing is not my forte. Mm -hmm. So uh, having, having a, a small team to help me amplify those messages. Uh, this is super helpful in one way we've been able to remain consistent across the board there. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you guys are, you're, you're very thoughtful about social media. You know, some people, it can be a huge distraction. That's why I asked, you know, you as an owner of a company, um, you know, time is very, very valuable. And, you know, the time that we're scrolling on social media, TikTok, you know, consuming stuff, um, it, it, can we don't want to waste it right so i love that you guys have like a plan and play to like okay this is what we're going to do for content and whatnot so and noticing that hey social media is not my strength so let me let me give this to the team to let them handle it so very important um so yeah man i'd love to know more about your background and you growing up i know before we hopped on the call you said that you're in buffalo stuck in kind of a snowstorm right now talk to us about you you growing up i know you're from new york but talk to the people yeah, absolutely. So I, I was uh, born and raised in Manhattan and Floral Park, Queens. My my family's from San Pedro Sula in Honduras. Mm -hmm. um, so shout out to all the catrachos and catrachos out there. Um, but I love my my whole my Latin communities, uh, mm -hmm. no matter where you're from. But uh, yep, so New York City 
And uh, we eventually moved out to the suburbs and uh, end, ended up settling down in a small town in Westchester County called Mamaroneck. Um, and that's where I ended up uh, completing high school. I was the first in my family to graduate high school and then uh, ended up falling in love with math while I was part of the robotics team in high school and went up to uh, Western New York, University of Rochester, uh, which is where I went to college. And then settled up here in Western New York and found myself getting the entrepreneurial bug. Yeah. And uh, moved out to Buffalo, which is only an hour uh, mm -hmm. west of Rochester and uh, moved here in 2014. So I've been here for eight years. Doesn't seem like it's that long. And uh, I was actually commuting back and forth for a while uh, between Rochester and Buffalo. But then, as you can imagine, uh, there's one... Uh, highway that separates yeah. both cities and it's uh one hell of a highway to drive during a snowstorm wow. had a couple of close calls and finally i was like you know what i'm just gonna bite the bullet and move to buffalo and uh, yeah that's, that's what brought me here yeah absolutely so you was the first to graduate high school uh <laughs> were you the first to, obviously you were probably the first to graduate college um were you the first to start a business in your family i was yes okay uh, and yeah, that was, uh, you know, a little interesting with the family. It, yeah. They quite they didn't quite understand what that meant. I think it was, I um, mean, you know, I grew up in a household where education was the number one priority. You mm -hmm. needed to go to school, get your degree, and then that would qualify to get you a full-time job with a decent salary and benefits. And um, so choosing a, the less chosen path yeah. wasn't well received initially. And yeah, so yep, yep, go ahead. Yeah, and so but they've um they've been su super supportive. I think it was just any parents fear that mm -hmm. um you know, perfect example, right? If you don't have health care healthcare insurance, you're going to be paying <laughs> yeah, a lot of money for care. For sure. And, and so I think it was it really just came from a place where my parents wanted you know, they they were being protective and wanted what was best for me and and yeah. they could they really quite see the path forward, you know, and starting a company. And I also didn't do a really good job of explaining mm -hmm. to them what it is that I was building. <laughs> so yeah, I could probably doing that a little better. Yeah. So that's something that we talk a lot about on the, the podcast, especially when we have guests on that their family is from a different country. You know, they come here, they work hard. And at the end of the day, they want their child to be safe and secure. Right. And entrepreneurship is neither one of those <laughs> right it's it's it, at times it's not safe and it, at times it's not secure so um you know they think the best thing for the child is you know to get to go get the education get a job and whatnot get a secure career um but you know talk to us about the feeling of you being the first in your family to graduate high school college and start a business um and talk to us why, how you even got that entrepreneurial bug where you wanted to go outside and, you know, do something different? Yeah. You know, I, I didn't really think of it in those terms when I was going through high school and college. Uh, I enjoyed school and I enjoyed very much challenging myself. Certain subjects weren't always easy to me. Um, I was fortunate that I had a good support network around me and friends that had a wide range of interests. So I was, I felt like my curiosity was always peaked. And um, my dad always says my grandfather was like that, you know, if he had had the opportunities I have today, he probably would have, you know, grabbed at all of them <laughs> if he could. Yeah. And, uh, and so I've, I've always just been very curious and, and, and um, ambitious and competitive. I've always wanted to just excel and learn mm -hmm. as much as I can. So that's just part of who I am. So I felt like mm -hmm. school got me, you know, to, to high school um, and college was expected of me. And I wanted that for myself too. And, uh, and then I did it. And then the, the entrepreneurial piece, the entrepreneurial piece didn't come till later. You know, I um, had a couple of jobs that I wasn't really happy in and it just um, not all of them. I mean, I, I certainly from, for my, um, for my, for my jobs in the education space, I'm truly grateful for, and that's what's actually mm -hmm. steered me in this direction of building Thimble.io. But, um, you know, when you, when you work, I think when you're in your twenties, right, it's all about trying to figure out 
figuring out what you love, like don't like um you know like summer jobs restaurant gigs um, working in healthcare writing grants um i even contemplated business school at one point public health school like i mean there was there was there was a lot right yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um sometimes i'm still like that even while i'm building the company I'm building now, um, sometimes I'm like, I feel like going back to school one day. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure yeah. I'm, I'm sure some people are cringing while they're listening to this, but um I don't know. I just for me, like so I, I have a friend who who um friend of a friend. I don't okay. I don't know her that well, but her story is very compelling. She is in her 50s and she was just accepted to medical school. Mm. And and when I heard that, I was just like, congrats. Like that's amazing. Mm. Like that's like all the power to you. You're probably going to be an amazing doctor because this is something that you felt you really wanted to do at this point in your life. And I've also met people in their 60s and even 70s who have, who just, who are just ambitious and they want to do these yeah. things. They, they go for it. I'm like, that's the person I, that's the kind of life I want, right? Like I want to yeah. be able to, 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 to choose these paths for myself. Absolutely. Uh, and so how, so how old are you? I'm actually 41, believe it or not. <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> bro, I, I did not know your age bro if you didn't tell me your age i would have thought you were like i'm not even joking right now like 25 <laughs> <laughs> then that's just, it's just, believe me the number of in investor meetings that i go to oh my and they think gosh. i'm like in graduate school or in college and i'm like no i've really been at this for many years believe me <laughs> wow so okay wow <laughs> That's crazy. Okay, so you get the entrepreneurial bug. What's what's the first business that you jump into? Like the first thing, I know that you had a business in the higher ed industry, but was there something before that, or was that the first thing that you jumped into? As far as um as as an entrepreneur, yes. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I kind of started my own my own tutoring business. Uh, yeah. Um, for a little bit and because one of my first jobs out of college was um, I was a college admission officer so I was working at the engineering school um, reading applications spreading awareness around our um, flagship engineering programs at the school to public school kids so um, I did that for a little bit and I, I basically took that knowledge and turned it into a consulting gig mm -hmm. and was working with with um, students in high school and college who were um, who had aspirations to go into graduate school and uh, was helping them with their essay writing. And then most importantly, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, preparing for a certain standardized exam. So like the Your GMAT exam. and ERDs. And, uh, but I, it was just me. I, I actually got a little bored of that. And I had spent some time doing some student teaching at a couple of inner city schools, teaching math and, mm -hmm. I was now working with kids who a lot of whom were very bright, but we just didn't have any programs and resources to support their interest in, in tech. And, um, and so after doing that for a little bit and thinking hard about what I wanted to do when I grew up, I decided I wanted to create a dent in the education space. Mm. And um, that's what I really just resonated with out of everything yeah. I had done up until that point. And uh, certainly, like, there was a certain level of uncertainty. Like, I don't think I know the most about teaching or educating. Right, right. I, I can certainly identify the challenges. And based on my own experiences, what I observed, there certainly problems that exist in our space. And we know mm -hmm. about our education um, in the U.S. and how much can be improved. And uh, so I just said, well, let's choose it and let's go with it. And, you know, it, yeah. it, I participated in, in a, in a um, three-day event called Startup Weekend. Mm. It's a 72-hour event where you present a challenge to an audience. And the wow. audience at the end of the first day can um, basically approach you and, and mm. enlist themselves to be a part of your yeah. team. Yeah. And, and then you spend that weekend building some kind of MVP. And then wow. at the end, you present to us... Um, to a, a panel of judges. Mm -hmm. um, so I had told myself that if we placed in the top three, if we placed in the top three places that I, that I would go ahead and pursue this idea. Um, and then we ended up coming in third place. And so I was like, wow. all right, I guess we're doing it. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, what was the name of that first business? It was called Gradfly. Gradfly. Uh, so I, I was listening to an interview and you, I, I know you came to a point with it where you had to pivot, right? It was either uh, you, you had to pivot to a d- different direction or you had to throw in the towel. And now you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, you're, you're very competitive. You don't like to lose. You know what I'm saying? You want to learn as much as possible. Speak to that moment in that mindset that you had to have to like ha- have the feeling like, man, this is maybe it's not working out the way I want it to. I can either throw in the towel or I can pivot and do something else. You know, there's a lot of people that reach that point and they're like, no, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep going when they really should do something else or just let it go. So give some advice to some people out there in your perspective. What made you keep going? Why didn't you throw in the towel? Um, how were you feeling in that moment where you were just like, this is this is your first business. This is your baby. You don't want to quit. But now you're forced to move in a direction, different direction. Talk to us about that. Yeah, you know, that's, it's, it's, um, I think it's going to change from person to person. Um, For sure. You know, I probably spent three years building Gradfly and unfortunately we ran out of money. We had built a product that wasn't really that great and it's tough to sell in the higher ed space. It's, it's, um, you know, unless you've lived in that world and yeah, I, I worked in that space for a little bit, but even then for what we wanted to create, you know, we we did land a couple a couple of customers, a, a community yeah. college, and uh, actually the University at Buffalo was one of our first customers. But um, it it wasn't a problem. You could argue there that it failed for many reasons. Um, I think it's just it was my first mm-hmm. uh, time in the rodeo, kind of thing, yeah. you know. And, um, and that th- I was also inexperienced. I wasn't. I had I'd had some um, knowledge around building a business, but not a ton. And that was a phase in my life where I felt like I was reading a business book every week. Mm. Um, so no question, like I wanted it to succeed so badly, For but sure. it just wasn't working. And there becomes a point where you're just like, okay, this is not working. I got to figure something out. And, you know, I'm the kind of person that listens, um, to advice and feedback. And I was getting all that from advisors, even the customers, but then you're like, okay, something's got to change. Yeah. Um, and I was probably heads down in the dark for like three months, like trying mm-hmm. to figure out, okay, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. You know, I don't know what grad fly is going to become. I know that there's something here. I know there's a need. But I think it's continue. It has to evolve. The problem that I am solving is going to evolve into a bigger problem that people are willing to pay money for. Mm-hmm. Um, and because it's education, there is inherently good in this. So I feel like that's fulfilling in and of itself, right? It was just a matter of okay, how do I make a living? <laughs> how do I make this a business that can generate a profit so I can continue doing the things I like doing? And um, and this was so between 2012 and 2014, I was heads down building Gradfly. And then between 2014 and 2015, I participated in this program sponsored by Google. It's called um, Google Next. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was kind of like a tear up from Startup Weekend, which is what initially got me started. And I was commuting to Toronto, Canada, which, mm-hmm. is, which isn't which is that far from Buffalo. It's about an hour and 45 minutes on a good day. Exactly. And... It was an eight week program. I was driving there every Monday and I had no car at the time. I was actually, or I think my, I think my car, there's, I think my car was in the shop. <laughs> I didn't have enough money to repair it. So using my friend's car to drive to Toronto and, uh, and it was through this program that I was working with a couple of advisors and we're like, okay, what you're, what you've been working on for the, for the last two, three years, you have some really good meat and bones here. It, it wasn't all for nothing. Hmm. Let's just continue. Let's get this in front of a different audience. You know, let's instead of because because Gradfly was for the higher ed space, but we were targeting engineering students. It was like a LinkedIn for engineers mm-hmm. to show off their projects. We we had a website and we had a small community of people talking to each other about robots, drones, all different types of electronics. Um, some were hobbyists and some were parents. And so what I started to do was just 
get a little more um, inquisitive with mm. a, a lot of those people on the site. And I would ask, mm. hey, um, I'll give you five bucks if you give me 15 minutes of your time. I would like to ask you some questions on why you continue to use this site. Um, and then it totally dawned on me one day when one of these folks was a was a dad who had um, a seven year old. And this guy was an engineer um, at Sun Microsystems, mm -hmm. which is a big, semi, big semiconductor company. And uh, he's like, I want to get my kid interested in tech. Mm -hmm. And um, I like the discussions. We're having trouble finding parts to build a robot. Yep. You know, we got to teach ourselves how to build it. And then, you know, we got to put it all together and make it do stuff, fun stuff. And then that's when I was like, all right, this is cool. And that's really when the when that, everything just started to change because then I was like, all right, I see an opportunity here. And he was the only one. There were moms and dads who wanted to get their kids interested and it evolved to be this more like educational play. Like, what could we do to bring this to people? Like, if people can't find the parts to build a robot, let's get, to, let's get it to them. If they don't know how to build it, we'll teach them how to. Mm -hmm. We'll figure out how to find the parts and then we'll develop the content to teach them how to build it. Mm -hmm. And then that is like between 2014, 2015, that's when it all just sort of happened, you know, like it clicked, it, it yeah, started to yeah. click. And that's when I became even more motivated. So yeah. between 2012 and 2015, I was basically telling myself, hang on, there's something here, go get a bartending gig <laughs> while you figure it out. If you really love it that much, then just hang on with it. Um, as long as possible. I know that's not always feasible. I was fortunate I didn't yeah. have, like, have kids or anything. So I was just like, mm. just doing this. And then, um, for sure. And what then finally, it? and then finally, you know, I, I was able to meet um, one of my first co founders uh, for the business. And then we didn't really have a chunk of money in our bank account to fund the company. So we ended up doing a Kickstarter campaign. Mm. And um, that was what initially helped fund mm. the project because we had we 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 were originally banking to raise twenty five thousand dollars in funding, um, and we actually ended up doing twelve hundred percent over that, so a little um, just shy under three hundred thousand dollars in a month, mm -hmm. and that was the initial capital that that set us off. So long answer to your question, yeah, but yeah, no, I love it because that leads really next to, into the next thing I want to talk about is um, raising capital as a startup. Um, you just said you had a, a campaign in 2017. You guys raised just shy of $300,000. I would love for you to speak upon, um, you know, talk more about raising capital and what makes a successful campaign for other startups out there that are actually listening. Um, it, this all depends on what your business is. And it, it's all, uh, it really just depends, right? But I would love for you to give some some insight on raising capital for a startup and what does this a successful campaign look like for you yeah certainly well i think it's it's um it's important to say you know i i don't come from wealth and i don't know people with money so it makes it even harder to fundraise so if you're in that position like you gotta have an open mind it requires patience sorry and not to cut you off already but so are you saying if someone was in that position they would have the ability just to go to friends and family and say hey i have this business idea I need three hundred thousand dollars. Let me get a check, and they can they can make that happen. But for people like us and listening to the podcast, we got to go to other directions, right? Uh, and I'm sure you'll you'll dive into it, such as different yeah, platforms, you know, crowdfunding platforms. Yeah, I mean, I, I I just speak for myself. You know, I'm sure there are people listening to this podcast who maybe have a friend of a friend who works for a venture capital firm, and you know that connection alone is going to maybe enable that first meeting. Whereas I might have to try 10 people to get that first meeting, you know, and every entrepreneur goes through this, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's just part of the, part of the game, but um, the, the, the crowdfunding piece was appealing because it was accessible and it required just hard work on our end. And then we thought we had a great story. So I, I think it's you know, for the crowdfunding campaign to work successfully, you got to sort of be in line with your your own story um mm -hmm. and the passion behind it For on sure. why you're trying to build this venture and if you can if you can capture that in a very well made two to three minute video mm. that's gonna help certainly um that's part of it you know the the campaign itself the copy the video the the overall presentation Kickstarter was certainly helpful and thankfully thanks to um the new New York City Economic Development Center 
they were able to get us an introduction to someone at Kickstarter. So we had a one-on-one -on -one relationship and they hel helped us craft our campaign from start to finish. Obviously that came from us, but it was yeah. nice to have a set of eyeballs to be like, okay, fix this, fix this. This looks good. You know, great video, you know, yeah. shoot. I'll, I'll, it was just nice to have that. And then as far as like generating excitement, because you got to spread the word, right? Um, being in Buffalo, I was part of the ecosystem and uh, I was part of the a couple of incubators and uh, an innovation center where there were, you know, hundreds of startup companies and people who came in and out every day. Uh, and so we started locally to build awareness. We we started there. We started off. We, we What we did is we took a, a big white poster board and we wrote down every single network we're associated with like college, high school, fraternities, sports teams, friends. Um, I mean, family, obviously, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then we made it very easy for people to, to, to spread the word. Um, so we created an exclusive landing page that would make the campaign easy in a click of a button, right? And so that having those things in line, right? And we didn't just come in to, to that. We learned, we talked to other campaign creators, other successful campaign creators, and we picked their brain. We were like, what did you do? Tell us what the recipe for success is here. Mm -hmm. um, I would look, I would go on Kickstarter and find the top campaigns and be like, okay, here's the campaign that generated over a million bucks. Yep. They must yep. have done something right. Let's try to model after it, make it our own, obviously. And then um, once were um this really hit home was we were able to hit our twenty five thousand dollar mark in forty eight hours. Wow, that's when we really started to share the story because people want to write about success, right? Like media outlets. So we then took that story. We said, "Hey, we just finished this forty eight hour campaign. We reached our twenty five thousand dollar mark, and we still have you know another month left um, mm -hmm. before this campaign closes." and we also spent a lot of time on Twitter. Um, yeah. One of the um, big, biggest successes on biggest successes on Twitter was we got um, we caught the attention of an editor at Engadget, and they wrote a super small paragraph <laughs> about us. But it was enough to bring like yeah, it must have yeah. generated easily a hundred k in a couple wow. of days. Just wow. just that little paragraph alone, and we had several, but that was the one that we just saw because we saw our campaign go up. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Wow, that's crazy. So now I'm curious, you know, you guys are, you guys, are, you're in the educational industry. And I'm just curious, why don't schools have these programs? Is it funding? Is it interest? Um, and also explain for those that don't understand the importance of these programs, can you break it down for us? But what is the biggest reason why they're not in our school? Because I remember going up, in school, I don't ever remember any like STEM programs or like any science classes or anything. maybe earth science or something like that. But just the basics, that was it. I don't remember anything else. There's so many reasons. You yeah. can argue it's a funding reason. You can you can argue that it's awareness. Uh, I remember when I was working at, at the school in, in Rochester, I, the one of the principals was like, what's what's STEM? education mm -hmm. and they thought it had to do with like stem cell research then and i was like no we're talking like well. stem science tech engineering math these are essential skills that our school is not teaching our kids outside of the general sciences right there's yep. science bio chem physics those are essential right and there's certainly stem covered in those but what, what we're talking about are skills that are relevant to today's workforce such as cybersecurity. Mm -hmm uh coding uh machine learning robotics ai blockchain you know there's all, this mm -hmm. whole other world of tech out there that um that that is definitely flourishing but you go into some of these schools and there's it, it, there's like the bare minimum of if not yeah, right nothing yeah. at all yeah. and, and so what are we doing to generate awareness to kids at a young age so that as they mature, get to middle school, they can at least consider these careers as a possible path. Mm -hmm. um, 
I always argue like by the time someone gets to middle school, it's already too late because they've already generated their own opinion about what STEM means. Either it's uncool or, you know, their friends don't think it's cool or, or whatnot. And uh, and so what what kind of chance are we giving our kids today to 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 get to that point? And, right. you know, in my case, um, robotics was part of the gifted and talented program why like this should be available to every kid at the school and yeah. if you don't have enough teachers to support then the number of students like there's something yeah. wrong there yeah. right so, um that, that's part of it is um how do we make this accessible to every boy and girl not just a certain subset of the student population for sure, for sure. that's what we're trying to do at thimble like we're trying to get kids interested at a young age but not because we want to hold on to those kids while, you know, like my vision for, for symbol IO is we get kids in, at a young age interested so that by the time they get to high school, they're like, I want to join this robotics team because I have the basic skills needed to be part of it. And, or, or you know, that's just an example. It doesn't have to be yeah, like for sure. Olympia team yeah. or, uh, you know, who knows a rocket right. camp at NASA. <laughs> no, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I would love for you to uh, dive into more, about what you guys are doing at Thimble, some of the services that you guys offer. Yeah, certainly. So the best way to describe it, it's a curriculum that's for K-12 schools. It's broken down into four skill levels. So we got um, sort of like a beginner, intermediate, advanced, and then college level. We we call it something else. We call it apprentice, maker, technician, and then master technician. And then each of those levels has four different kits um, associated with that level so that you know in the apprentice level they're learning basic electronics and programming then they learn how to build a wi-fi robot and then the, the joystick for the robot so everything builds on itself but as they progress through these skill levels they're learning more advanced skills and a lot of times they're reusing these components they're just applying them in different ways and by the time they're getting to like a master technician level they're learning college level entry skills electrical wow. engineering engineering um so that's part of it i mean i think the 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 equipment the kits right there that's part of the equation the other piece is the um the content um you know anybody can create a kit so to speak but how you deliver that instruction uh and the thoughtfulness that goes behind that instruction is what matters it's how i like to break it down is like everybody remembers that dynamic teacher they had when they were kids yeah. um, that inspired them in some way or captivated them that's that's really what what we're trying to do in in our space is, is be mm -hmm. that like dynamic teacher 100%. yeah i love that um, and um and so that that's part of it so the content the video tutorials the evaluation piece um because it's important that we understand whether kids are retaining that knowledge and then later uh understand if it's moved the needle on the, their interest level like hey what do you think do you think this is something you might want to do and we're not going to force it on anyone right like but um you should at least again for me it's all about making these kids consider it as a potential option and then um the one last piece is also working with teachers we get a lot of teachers who mm -hmm. didn't go to school for robotics or programming or any of these other technology subject areas but they're being asked to step up to the plate and teach these skills and they're the ones that are usually require the most help and so we provide that hand holding because you know, kids can smell fear. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. if you're gonna put up a teacher up there to teach this in front of a classroom, you wanna make sure that they at least understand the basics. Yeah, they know, um, yeah. And so that's, you know, that's, it's part of a package and then that's what we're, we're putting out there. Mm, I love it, I love it, amazing. Um, my hat's off to you guys and your team because that's, that's very impactful for our community and something that's very much needed. Um, I wanna shift gears a little bit as we start wrapping this conversation up. You know, I'm curious as a founder and a CEO, where is somewhere in your business, maybe in life, that you feel like you're playing it safe? Hmm. Hmm. Playing it safe. Man, that's a tough one because I'm challenged on all fronts. I find. I don't know. That's a tough one, Chris. <laughs> I don't think I play it safe. It's, 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 I'm it's always awesome. agreeing about something, you know, like I'm a very low key dude. So, I mean, so, I, there's a lot going up here all the time. A hundred percent. So let me ask you this. What drives you to be 
on go, quote unquote, at all point, always learning, always being um, inquisitive, uh, what drives you to, to even have this, to, to have your business? Like what, what drives you? What's your biggest motivation factor? A few things too. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. sorry that I can't give you just one answer, no, but no. Um, certainly my team's part of it. Um, yeah. I've like, I've been, I've been at this for a few years now, five, almost six years. And they, it's truly, uh, we still have a long ways to go by the way. Mm. And, and when I talk to entrepreneurs, I'm part of a few communities of founders. I mean, it's great to talk to each other because we know what it's like to build something yeah. from the ground up and you're going to go through those dark days. And when you have those successes, it sort of cancels out. Yeah, for stuff. sure. Um, but uh, the team has certainly been a part of it for me more than ever this last year and a half. Like, it's just, it's, it's just some, um, when you have a group of people that work with you and they believe the same thing that you do, like yeah. we need to get this out. We want to educate and inspire the next generation of, of tech leaders. Um, it's just an amazing thing because for a while it's just you and you're sort of like marching mm -hmm. your own parade. Right. And, and, um, and it's, and it's, and it's not even about me. It, it's just, I'm trying to like, for I'm sure. trying to, to um, accomplish this uh, huge undertaking and um, having the people around you has certainly been helpful. And I've made mm -hmm. some hires this last year that are just incredible. Um, Everybody is just amazing. So that, that's, that's one thing that, that makes, that's part of the reason why I get up every day too. And then I'm in education tech, you know, like we're in the business of educating kids and that's just like when you walk into a classroom and you see a, a student mm -hmm. using your program, yeah. it's like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's really like a, such a unique feeling. Um, and, and this is like on a case by case basis where we're currently just, we just secured a partnership in India to educate mm -hmm. 5 million Indian students by the year 2027. Wow. And wow. we are working in schools where they don't have access to laptops and tablets. Um, and so we're we're going in there, thankfully, thanks to a philanthropist, they will have access to laptops. And that totally changes the, the game now because now they're able to start um, learning how to code, yeah. doing you know, like trivial things that we take for granted here with the tech, the technology we have, we're going to go over there and and give the kids a chance to again, you know, like learn these skills and hopefully change the trajectory right on on the the path that they're currently on. Now they have access to all these skills, and who knows what they will become, you know, years from now. But one hundred percent, that is like, yeah, for me that's gold. That that whole picture that I just painted. I, I was just gonna say, you know, it's really refreshing to talk to other founders, CEO, entrepreneurs that are really selfless people and that truly want to impact their community, impact the world and leave it better than how they came into the world. You know, we have a lot of people on here that talk about making money and, you know, doing stuff for their family, which is great. And we think we should do that. But I'm just saying it's refreshing to talk to people that are having an impact like that, where they're edu educating people in a different country um it's it's refreshing to me and it you know it makes me happy for sure amazing stuff yeah no well listen you know because i also want to take this to latin america so yeah um, we just met someone yesterday it was it's too it's too premature to tell where this will go yeah. but they have um connections to someone in mexico mm. where they they would try and replicate this india partnership that we have um mm. in wow. jaipur and bombay and bring it to Mexico City and surrounding Latin American countries. And I got really excited because I was like, listen, yeah. our lessons are already in Spanish as well. Yeah. And uh, so for, for me, it's just let's 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 do, let's build a pilot. Let's prove it works. You know, proof of concept is always big for me. And if it if it works, then let's slowly expand on it. So um, that hope, you know, that, yeah. for me, I, I hope that we can get there in the next few years. Absolutely. That's amazing. So wrapping up this conversation, man, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, sharing your story, talking more about your company. Where can people reach out to you if they have any questions or if they have questions about the program? Um, and I'll go ahead and link everything in the description of this podcast, but go ahead and talk to the people. Yeah. Um, 
please reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me, Oscar, Oscar Pedroso. Mm -hmm. um, you can also reach out to me directly by email, oscar at thimble.io. And um, yeah, just, you know, just reach out. I'm, I try to respond to every email yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. I'm pretty much an open book. So I'm yeah, open yeah. for founders out there. Like I always love to pay it forward because I know I was there. Mm -hmm. I still am there. I'm always reaching out to founders who are slightly ahead of me, yeah. but for founders that are just getting started, you know, with, with five years doing this, there's, I'm always happy to help any way I can. Um, 100%. Yeah, he definitely open book. He re he responded back to us. So and he agreed to be on the podcast. So yeah, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it, Oscar. Make sure you guys go ahead and follow us on Instagram at Latin Wealth. Share this episode with one other friend or family that needs to hear this information. And on that note, we'll catch you guys next week. Peace out. Thank you, Chris.